Welcome back to RBC After Class. Today on Second Act is Troy Schumacher, a New York City-based choreographer, a soloist with the New York City Ballet, and the director of Ballet Collective. I hope you enjoy. My name is Troy Schumacher. I am currently a soloist with New York City Ballet. I've been dancing there since 2005, and I'm also the director of a company called Ballet Collective that connects choreographers with composers and visual and other non-performing artists to collaborate and create new ballets. I also I am a freelance choreographer and I do projects for other ballet companies and modern dance companies and some commercials and video projects and I also teach ballet. When did you know you wanted to pursue a career in dance? Pretty much from when I started it. Um, I, I started with tap dancing and I just really fell in love with it. I had a rough start my first couple weeks but then I just fell in love with the challenge. My parents say that, especially once I started ballet, they never even had a conversation with me where they questioned whether or not it was something I really wanted to do because I just went really all in. I kind of canceled everything else I was doing, other extracurriculars, and I just really um, did it. Like I was so far behind. I didn't really start ballet until I was 13. So I just, had so much catching up to do and I had really not a lot of natural flexibility and not great feet and not great turnout so I just was constantly um, just coming home exhausted every day from working so hard but it was just something I just was doing like I didn't um, it wasn't a conscious choice really I just like started doing it and I was like just trying to get better all the time. What is your favorite part of being a dancer? My favorite part of being a dancer, those moments when everything kind of falls away and you're just there performing. It's very much like in the moment and strangely kind of meditative. It's just, you've been working constantly over and over again on things and practicing your technique, working on the choreography. And then those moments where you feel like you are, um, you've let go in a really great way. And to be honest, and I'm sure other people that you've spoken with and you experience this too, it's like, that's not every time you go out on stage, right? You have these moments where everybody has it, where you're thinking about like what you're having for dinner that night. And you can't control those thoughts. You're not trying to have those thoughts, but you just can't always have those spectacular moments. I think that's maybe why I would say it's one of my favorite things about being a dancer because it's you can't control when it happens and you can't lead to it and sometimes you're getting ready for the show and you're saying this is going to be a bad show and it ends up being great and sometimes you're like I'm going to go out there and kill it and then you're you do your first saute and then all of a sudden you think about like oh I forgot to take my laundry out of the dryer <laughs> Yeah, it's you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I've been sort of fascinated by sports psychology recently. Okay. And one of my favorite psychologists, Dr. Michael Gervais, he talks about this idea of no mind and how world performers, top performers experience this feeling of no mind where literally everything falls away and that top performers tend to say it happens around 10 to 15% of the time, which is really what you're describing, really rare, but you have to put in the work in order to be able to achieve that, that state of, as you say, med meditation. So right. I think that that's really cool that you um, mentioned that because I definitely, for, for me, that was one of the most special things to just completely lose yourself and not think about the technique and not think about all the things, but really just express and, and lose yourself. What types of people succeed in ballet? I feel like I'm drawn to people who have had kind of like challenges like I've had, like setbacks and opportunities to persevere. And I think that sometimes when ballet is too easy, for some people, whether that's your physical limitations, whether that's injuries, whether that's other things going on in your life or your family that make it hard for you to dance, it, it makes it more special. So I think that people who ballet is so easy for them and they end up being really successful, they never have any 
setbacks in their careers. Like that definitely exists, but I, I think that people who stick with it have these challenges that they've had to kind of overcome. So if it's not easy for you physically, in order for you to be successful, you have to work really hard. And if it's really easy for you physically, you have to find your own way to ferment that struggle inside. Um, because no yeah, knows- it's an art. It's an art and it needs to be honest. I feel like when I'm seeing a performer express, not the pain, but the struggle and the honesty, I am so invested in the performance. And when it's hollow, I find myself nitpicking at the technique and all of the other little things. Like I can't turn my brain off, you know? Right. Yeah. I I mean, I think we all go through different stages mentally about what we think is most important in dance. But I think the longer you do it, you realize that like technique is a means to an end. It's not the end. And sometimes you have to treat it like it's the end, but people who don't get past that, that's those are those performances that you're talking about. They end up being hollow because that's all it is. Right. So it's these competing forces that, you know, as pressure for techniques and physicalities to get more and more impressive as they have for kind of decades and decades, finding that balance is where the challenge is. Yeah. I mean, as, as a teacher, I feel like I create those boundaries, you know, it's all technique at, at the beginning. And, and then as they advance, then you begin to blur the lines and you want to break all the rules you've set for them, you know? So right. it's, uh, it's funny how it, that works. I mean, a great example, I think, is when teachers say like, no phrasing, right? Because you're just trying to teach solid musicality and rhythm and how to be like precise, because if you can't be precise, then you don't know how to phrase and you're, but like phrasing is literally the foundation of musicality, right? And there's musical phrasing and there's unmusical phrasing, but it's just like speaking. You don't just speak in a monotone the whole time. You have to create, as you say, like these boundaries and education because there's too much to focus on in ballet even when you've been doing it for so many years i think from educational purpose sometimes when a teacher tells you to do certain things you know hopefully there's a there's a purpose behind it that may pay off years later why did you decide to move into choreography i moved into choreography kind of the exact same way i moved into dance and ballet and basically everything i've done um is i just tried it i didn't have any motivations to become a choreographer just like I didn't take my first ballet class thinking I was going to be a professional ballet dancer you said these super long layoffs as you remember at New York City Ballet like 12 weeks um, over the summer and so I just decided I was gonna try it and just like anyone would go to like a art supply store and just like buy a canvas and some paint and just like see what happens. So I just decided like I was going to give this a shot and if I enjoyed doing it or what the product was was good I would try it again and if I didn't like I wouldn't and that's just basically how I started. My first piece was probably not very great like I haven't watched it that was in 2009 but I enjoyed you know putting movement to music and that process and I think it just like anything else it's a craft that takes years to really develop. It's such a confidence game, choreographing and working with dancers, dealing with your own insecurities and artists who work in different forms that I collaborate with. I collaborate with so many different people. They always are just like, wow, I could never do that. It's like a composer trying to write a symphony in front of an orchestra or, you know, a, a writer writing as an editor is looking over their shoulder. It has like its severe limitations that way. Um, And certain choreographers, they pre-choreograph everything. A lot of really successful ballet choreographers do that. They do everything so that they don't have to deal with that level of creation. I don't love working that way because I have a more responsive um, style in choreographing. You know, I do it when I have to, but I mostly create like in the studio and in on specific dancers. So that has definitely been like an up and down process, especially early on, like learning how to deal with your own insecurities is, you know, 
50% of having a successful time in the studio. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I've, I've worked with choreographers who have planned everything out and, and then as you say, some that choreograph on the spot. It's really interesting. Some artists, Painters, for example, have planned, mapped everything out, or it's just all feeling and emotion and experiencing in the moment. And um, that's really cool that you are a choreographer who really stays in the moment and tries to feed off of the people in the room. Yeah. I mean, I do hours and hours and hours of planning before you I go. Have, and you have to know the music, like backwards and forwards. It has to be. I mean, I, I've choreographed just on um, kids, and I feel like the more I know the music, the easier it is to create something. Yeah. So like that, that piece, especially if you're doing it in studio, you just, you have to know exactly what's coming next. In that right. Sense. Yeah, of course. I mean, so like I spend out, like I listen to a piece of music like a hundred times before I choreograph yeah. to it at least. And I also do hours and hours of movement research, but like so little of that actually makes it into the piece. I just, mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time dancing and I, I come up with the overall arching structure of like probably who's dancing when and what the overall concept of is, is the piece. So I, I really think that it's important for any piece to have like a reason to exist. Like yeah. so I always like to say like the question that I think every dance piece and I guess most works of art in general have to answer is like why is this and like why is it existing right so like yeah. who are the people and why are they dancing I think mm -hmm. for especially you know contemporary work it really that question needs to be answered or else it's just like why are we it's just another ballet so it's like some people spend all their time working on the steps and then don't answer that question. And then some people spend all their time working on that question and then it's hard to come up with the content. And when you get both of those together, that's when you have a really great work of dance. Do you have a personal philosophy or mantra that you live by? I guess not one that I really ever have tried to articulate, but I would say that my personal philosophy or, or mantra is just like trying to do your best to figure out like what the truth is, if there is a truth, uh, and not be limited in your ability to change your mind about things. So do your best to figure out what the truth is, but if something um, comes up and it's not, you're wrong. So fix and fix things and move on is I think something that I, I try to um, live by. Do you have any mental tools that have helped you over your career? I um, find like mindfulness meditation to be immensely helpful. I do that pretty much all the time when I'm choreographing. So I take 20 minutes out of the day and it's really um, astonishing how much my cognitive ability improves and how much I get like all of the kind of ancillary thoughts out of the way um, during that period. So I'm able to focus for longer. I'm able to be kind of like more sharp and astute, uh, which I really value. And then also, especially like chore choreography, like taking a step back is, can be really helpful. I think uh, perspective is so important. So, you know, a choreographic tool that I often engage in is if like, I can't figure out like, where to go next sometimes actually the problem is a little bit further back right like maybe i need to get rid of the 25 counts before this moment and then just like go in an entirely new direction so trying to always be like zooming in and zooming out what are the benefits to dance education discipline and obviously i mean that's the most obvious thing to say is discipline <laughs> being your own teacher right i think that that is you find the, the pleasure and improvement. And I guess like also what I was saying before about like finding your own truth, right? And I think that what's so valuable about ballet is that there's a framework, but there's not really like a scoreboard, right? So mm -hmm. and dance in general, it's like it's a personal journey, which I think is a valuable life lesson and that like you can with what you are able to have or achieve you can improve on your on your own pathway and I think that that is really valuable and so many people that I've spoken with who I've trained with growing up who no longer do it like they've instilled that in their lives and have 
found ways to really become successful because it's not um, just about writing a paper and you know submitting it. It's about like working on the same series of exercises for you know yeah forever people have found ways to really zoom in on something and focus on it and, and craft it and i think that that is an incredible life lesson for more videos like this one please check out our igtv channel at rye ballet or our youtube channel have a great day guys